Hello, and let's talk about Kashmir and the Public Safety Act. This is a law that allows the state to detain people for up to two years without trial. On the night of February 6, just hours before their five-month-long preventive detention was to end, the Ministry of Home Affairs slapped its provisions on two former chief ministers of Jammu and Kashmir, Mehbooba Mufti and Omar Abdullah. Before we talk to Gautam Navlakha about the latest developments in Kashmir, here is the story so far. On August 5, the Indian government abrogated Articles 35A and Article 370. Article 370 and 35A had granted Jammu and Kashmir autonomous status. Announcing this decision, the Home Minister, Mr. Amit Shah, had said that he was correcting a mistake made 70 years ago. The abrogation was passed by two-thirds majority in the Lok Sabha and also got the President's nod. The Congress party had opposed this bill in the Parliament. Recently, on 5th February, the former Chief Minister Omar Abdullah and Mehbooba Mufti were detained under the controversial Public Safety Act with charges such as glorifying militancy and promoting separatism in Kashmir. A dossier has been prepared on them in which Mufti has been in particular called dangerous and the dossier also said that she participates in insidious machinations and that she has an usurping nature. It calls her names like Daddy's Girl, Kota Rani and so on. I, I quote from the dossier, the, uh, 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 the subject, meaning Mehbooba Mufti, has a history of making provocative speeches and charge statements leading to incitement of violence on several occasions in her political career. Uh, the same dossier says that she's a potential threat to public order in view of the uh, prevalent security scenario. Of course, the dossier also acknowledges that uh, Mufti was a vocal voice against the center's dilution of uh, both the articles 370 and 35A and that she'd supported unlawful groups like the uh, Jamaat in Kashmir. So the government has also made similar charges against Omar Abdullah, uh, the other uh, former chief minister. In today's episode, we will speak with Gautam Navlikha about the PSA and what this means for the political representation of the people of Kashmir. Gautam, firstly, were you very surprised by the reimposition of the PSA? And, you know, it comes in the context of uh, why is it imposed on Kashmir again and again? Well, PSA, Public Safety Act, has been in operation since 1978. And since 1988, its use. I mean, when it was brought in, it was supposed to be meant for tackling timber smuggling and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is how it was used. But to be right from the very beginning, it had been used against political dissidents. But the scale of its use in increased enormously uh, since 1990. Uh, according to an estimate, in the last uh, 30 years, uh, no less than 17,000 people have been detained under Public Safety Act. So keeping that in mind, it's, it's a handy tool for authorities uh, since they picked up, I mean, once they charged Farooq Abdullah with PSA, mm -hmm. I think it was just a matter of time before they did the same with Omar Abdullah and Mehbooba Mufti. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the Prime Minister making on the floor of the Parliament uh, attacking by name Omar Abdullah and Mahbuba Mufti, deriding them, ridiculing them, uh, actually uh, reviling them uh, where they were not there to defend themselves. It was an act of, uh, it, was, it was clearly uh, indicative of what was in the offing as far as uh, these two personalities of two former chief ministers were concerned. So this was something they have done. But the interesting thing is that the dossier right. itself, in fact, this is not the first time that the dossier has come into it, become an issue. This has been the fate of PSA since it was, it has been, in, I mean, uh, uh, since uh, it's, it's, it's uh, um, um, you know, routinized manner in which it has been used. The, the charges which the authorities level against a person, uh, on, even on a prima facie reading, I mean, even just the face of it doesn't make much sense. But why, that does, why is that? Why does it? Not? I mean, they could be. They could be referring to, for instance, in Mia Kayum's case, uh, the, the, he, uh, his lawyers have claimed that the charges that have been framed against him, I mean, for the reasons why he has been booked, 
pertains to something he did or said in 2008 to 2010. We are now in 2020. Right. He was picked up in August 2019. What was it that happened immediately preceding that ought to have figured in the dossier? That doesn't happen. They're referring to uh, that he had been placed under the, the FIS uh, against him and things uh, earlier. The other important thing, Pragya, that you must keep in mind is that Public Safety Act, although it was enacted by JNK Assembly in 1978, August 1978, the remarkable thing is that for 40 years of, of, of its operation, no rules have been framed and no standard operating procedure has been laid down for enforcement of Public Safety Act. So it seems to be an arbitrary act, devoid of any rules. Mm -hmm. or any procedure, laid down procedures, uh, which is mandatory under the law and it has been used as often as possible. So whenever the government imposes the PSA, does it have to actually have a justification for it? Does it have to, when there are no rules, then how do you decide who gets booked under it? Well, if you go by experience in, uh, in 2017, uh, out of an estimated uh, thousand and <coughs> thousand four detentions, mm -hmm. this is from April 2016 to December 2017, a study showed that out of 1,004 detention orders that were issued, 998 were approved by the advisory board. Okay. okay. Now, it's an interesting history even of an advisory board. Uh, out of them around... 941 cases went in appeal to the High Court where they challenged uh, PSA. Mm. Remarkably, in 81% of cases, that is 764 cases, the High Court quashed uh, the, the detention orders, which meant that whereas advisory board upheld all these the same cases when they were referred to High Court, they were found wanting and in 81% of the cases they were quashed. The other interesting thing, Pragya, that one has to keep in mind is that um, while the number, uh, you know, that people get picked up and the High Court quashes him, what various reports of, I mean, studies of public Sa uh, safety act shows is that it's a it's a revolving door kind of a thing. So you get detained, you get booked under PSA, then you move your appeal after the advisory board rejects your uh, and upholds the detention. You move the high court for for quashing it. High court quashes it. No sooner the high court quashes, the same day or the very next day. Another new P, uh, 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 you know, PSA is invoked and the person gets booked under it. So it's like right. you come out and get and picked up again. This is so exactly it's like a revolving door. This is exactly what has happened to the two chief ministers in this case. Um, Not just the chief minister. There are many people who have spent more than 20 years under detention without being charged. Mm -hmm. The remarkable thing is that in Mia Kayum's case... The High Court judge said that if there is suspicion and apprehension, then the court has no mandate to look, in, look into that. So the court has also give, I mean, um, uh, refusing to apply its own mind and look at the detention orders to see whether the grounds mentioned or the dossier that is provided carries uh, something which is above board. Right. So the court is also abdicating its responsibility by saying that we can't do anything now because if the authorities have this suspicion and apprehension, then we have no reason to question them. Right. And therefore it can't be cautioned. How would people in Kashmir actually view this? It's been months of lockdown. Well, PSA has been used against political dissidents in the last more than 30 years. I mean, since its invocation. <clears throat> but in the last 30 years, even more so. And despite the fact that the High Court in so many orders and it's the, the percentage of, if you go by the numbers that have, uh, that uh, of, you know, uh, uh, PSA book, uh, persons who have been charged have been quashed, you'll find that in 
60 to 70 percent of the cases when the matter has been referred to the high court they have quashed it which means that a high and overwhelming uh, number of cases uh, there are no grounds for uh, for detaining a person One and in fact if there are, if there are serious charges then i think the best way is that you charge that person prosecute him let the trial establish his guilt or his innocence and then let the law follow its course detention becomes a way of shutting somebody without I mean, without rhyme or reason, it seems, and keeping them uh, behind bars for months and years together. Indefinitely. Yeah. Now, look at in Omar uh, Abdullah's and uh, Mehbooba Mufti's case. They were picked up and detained under Section 107 of CRPC. Okay. There is a limit beyond which they can't be kept under 107. Right. Just when it was lapsing, the government needed to keep them. They don't have any charge sheet. They don't have any case against them. All they can do is to keep them under detention. Once that course had run its course, they decided that, well, put them under PSA. Now it depends. Right now they are saying that they are a threat to public order. Public order means that under PSA, they can be detained for another up to a year. Okay. If it's a threat to security of the state, then <clears throat> your period of detention can increase to two years. So let us see what they do in the course. I mean, in the, if, the, if this detention is also coming to an end, it's quite likely as it has happened in the case of others, that they may invoke a uh, threat to security as an argument to keep them again uh, under detention. Going by the dossier, the language yeah. used in it, that does seem like... But the Pragya, the more important thing is that why is it that they are taking recourse, the government is taking recourse to detention of political activists and leaders. If they are so confident that the people are with them, that they are happy with abrogation of 370, this government claims that they are doing everything for the benefit of the people, they should not fear. I mean, instead of being cowards, let them free these activists and political leaders. Right. Because <clears throat> if they are so confident of themselves, mm -hmm. you have such a huge deployment of forces, you have access to draconian laws that you can use against anybody uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. There are no rights that exist, no constitutional freedoms. Let these activists and leaders be allowed uh, to, to be amongst them people and let's see what happens then. You know, Gautam, one of the things we see of late especially is two strands. On the one hand, you have these draconian measures. On the other hand, the government is talking about development, industrialization. So, you know, these two things, why are they proceeding on a parallel track? They seem so contradictory. Well, it seems like it's a, it's a cruel joke. You know, there's this news yeah. item in, in the today's Hindu, Hindu. Right? Yes. which basically talks about exactly yeah. this. No, it's, it's, that's what I said. It's a cruel joke. Just when you are picking up people, the detention of and the number of people who are under detention is unprecedented. It's very high. More than 450 people continue to be in detention and they have no chance, no escape, no hope of coming out. Because judiciary also seems to be abdicating its responsibility. But at a time like this, when nothing is happening, no constitutional freedoms are allowed to the Kashmiris, everything has been clamped down, no political activity is permitted, uh, journalists can get picked up for filing reports which are completely normal and above board, I mean without any, just newsworthy, news items, okay. they can be picked up. At a time like this to come out and say that we are now going to announce an industrial policy which is going to attract investments and in that the pride of place is being given to internet. IT-based industries. Now the existing IT-based industries in Jammu and Kashmir have been knocked down. Mm -hmm. They had to shut shop. People have lost their jobs. Investors who had invested in this or entrepreneurs who had started these enterprises have been bankrupted. You come out with a policy which says uh, to outside investors that you're going to be, that we are encouraging people to come and invest in IT-based units, that they'll be uh, 
uninterrupted power supply that broadband access would be and transmission of material and data would be uh, uh, without any interruption is, is a joke. It's a joke and a cruel joke at that. The internet operates at 2G speed. Okay. There is no broadband. The white list has only 350 odd uh, websites that are accessible. More than a million including websites of uh, home, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Home Department, Raj Bhavan, IT, every, even these are blacklisted. All right, so the, my point is when this is happening, power supply today in Kashmir during the winters, power, uh, there is a lack of power for up to 12 hours. So it's a joke when you tell investors that you're going to have uninterrupted, uninterrupted power supply, that there will be, uh, uh, you know, IT would be uh, uh, without any interruptions, so without any blockades right, and right. bans. All of this happening with detentions going on exactly. in parallel. Exactly. Right, and this you. is the cruel reality that Kashmir is going to get into. So you can talk in, on the floor of the parliament and claim and, and boast about a lot of things. Reality doesn't match that. Reality doesn't reveal, reveal that fact. Just a simple thing I'd like to end with. Just the fact that a single news item saying uh, that they should be banned on occasion of Afzal Guru's hanging. The mm -hmm. same Afzal Guru's hanging now which is and a question mark. There is a question mark after the rest of Devinder Singh. Right. The, uh, Government, despite its crackdown and all the control it had, it could not prevent the bunt from being successfully enforced. Now, what does it say? What does it say? <clears throat> that people are not with us. People are not with government of India. Right. They don't approve of government of India's policies. Right. So there are you. simple ways in which they express their opposition. Right. Thank you, Gautam. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are Two months into the Shaheen Bagh protests, the uh, women have shown no sign of giving up their agitation. The Supreme Court has said that the protesters cannot block the roads. Before we discuss this issue, let's take a uh, look at a video from the protest site where people have been sending one lakh postcards to the Supreme Court to ask the court to listen to their plea. This is to the Supreme Court, to the Honorable Judges, uphold the Constitution. We the people are counting on you. Don't send your puppets to Jamia and Shaheen Bagh, like those of Gunja, Gopal and Kapil. Are you so scared of students that you only can speak the language of guns? We would welcome you with roses. I'm here because I'm a citizen of this country and I don't have to prove this to anyone. To be a part of this beautiful India, I feel blessed. Please don't divide it on the basis of religion. Let the country be in peace and unity in diversity. Thank you. Anekta mein ekta, Hindi ki vishesta. इस देश को जाति धर्म मजहब में मत बांटिए आप नहीं बांट पाएंगे तुम्हारे सरकार कह रहे थे ये लोग पागल नहीं तो क्या है तुम अपने सरकार से ये कहना ये लोग पागल नहीं हुए हैं ये लोग सब कुछ समझ रहे हैं ये लोग सब कुछ समझ चुके हैं ये लोग जमूर की सदा हैं ये लोग दुनिया के रहनुमा हैं ये लोग पागल नहीं हैं
So we have with us Tariq Anwar from NewsClick, who's been reporting from Shaheen Bagh. Welcome, Tariq. Uh, Tariq, today the Supreme Court was hearing an appeal on the protest in Shaheen Bagh. Uh, can you give us an update? You're coming straight from there. What happened today? Uh, yes, uh, the petition was filed uh, um, by two lawyers, uh, Mr. Sahani and uh, Mr. Garg, uh, who had uh, challenged, who have challenged the uh, earlier De Delhi High Court order, which refused to pass any order to the Delhi police uh, for vacating uh, the stretch, which has been blocked uh, for the past uh, 50 days. So, um, um, saying that uh, the, uh, it was an SLP, a okay. special leave petition be uh, between the division bench of Supreme Court, uh, Justice uh, uh, Kim Joseph and Justice S.K. Call. And the petitioner uh, uh, sought uh, the prayer, main prayer was uh, um, before the Supreme Court uh, to give, to pass an order so that uh, uh, the entire stretch of uh, uh, Kalindi Queen Sarita Vihar Highway, mm -hmm. uh, which is blocked for so many days, uh, can be cleared and the uh, traffic ease can be provided to people. But the Supreme Court refused <coughs> to give uh, to pass any interim order, saying that they can't go ahead without hearing the other side of the argument. Uh, when the the petitioners uh, uh, insisted that the court must part, uh, pass an interim order, uh, the court said that uh, protests have been going on for the past 50 days. It can go a bit longer, but they can uh, they cannot do uh, go ahead without listening to the other side and issued a notice to the center and uh, adjourned the matter for February 17. Okay. So uh, this was the case. There uh, are <coughs> two or three important observations. Uh, 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 this was of course oral observation, not part of the order, uh, which was made by the, uh, by the bench, uh, mainly by uh, Justice S.K. Call, who said that uh, there cannot be indefinite protest in a common uh, area, if uh, everybody starts protesting everywhere, what will happen? Uh, you cannot inconvenience people. At the same time, he, he acknowledged that there is a right to protest and uh, those who are protesting should be provided an alternative place, a designated area where they can go and lodge their protest. So uh, this was oral observation made by the Supreme Court. So tell me, uh, Tariq, you know, the issue is that we have seen in Delhi that there has been a slowing down of the traffic because ever since the Shine Bagh protest started. Uh, is there a way to um, ensure that there can be a protest and the traffic is not blocked? Uh, there, there have been various things have been said about this that, you know, the police has blocked too long a stretch of it is one of the things we keep hearing. The Shaheen Bagh protesters are also, I think, um, uh, you know, they're not keen to move to any other place because they're rooted in, in the whole Jamia and Shaheen Bagh are interconnected, organically connected. So what do you think can be the way out? Um, you've been speaking to people there. What do they really say? See, uh, there is no uh, denial that there is uh, traffic inconvenience because uh, the stretch uh, which is blocked for so many days is being used by around um, over 3 lakh people every day. Uh, it is in fact a backbone after uh, no entry ends in the evening right. uh, that, that stretch becomes uh, uh, a hub of uh, business. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, commercial vehicle pass from there, the, the, that that uh, that stretch connects uh, not only uh, Delhi to uh, UP but also uh, Haryana okay. via Faridabad. So uh, that is a very important road. But what actually happened? The government tried it best uh, initially when the this this problem could have been very easily sorted out when they. Uh, a staged a protest, the government representative should should have come earlier, talk to the protesters. Uh, at least uh, they they would have taken uh, taken them into confidence that the, uh, your problem will be addressed. The government is ready for a negotiation. You please vacate the road, come to negotiation table. But it did not uh, happen from political leadership. What was done? The police was pushed forward to talk to the uh, protesters, which uh, generally don't work uh, in this tense situation. People don't believe police because uh, 
for for people or protesters police, uh, police is the real devil for them so uh, the police was initially used um, again when the election uh, drew closer the government uh, um, main uh, issue used that protest as main election plank you are talking about the central yes. government yes so um, the entire uh, campaign of delhi election centered around shahin bagh and it worked uh, to an extent for the bjp and it it, it ca in cashed it very well secondly uh, when the protest had uh, started <coughs> initially uh, uh, see i know uh, what what had uh, happened at the time there was uh, that road is divided by uh, there are two carriage way right. one uh, which is close to shahin bagh which is towards shahin bagh was blocked and uh, maximum a uh, stretch of around 700 800 meters is uh, still blocked the other carriage way was opened but initially it was blocked by the police and uh, the argument was given that uh, no, uh, it has been done to avoid any un toward situation they cannot to uh, allow any vehicle to ply on the other side because there will be a law and order situation then how, the how real do you think this apprehension of a law and order situation is is it a likelihood it is very convenient for the police uh, uh, they they play with law and order situation argument uh, they don't need any uh, permission to barge into the jamia campus but they need permission uh, to to intervene when jnu campus was being attacked they uh, uh, police across uh, india don't need permission they enter uh, houses they vandalize property in the name of uh, anti ca protesters uh, they do whatever they want uh, they damn care about what <coughs> the court says so so tarik now tell me something uh, if the protest is moved to some other site would shahin bagh lose some of its relevance are the people willing to move somebody uh, you know if you're given a designated site for protest would it be noticed because that's very important that that is that, that is the problem when you go to and talk to people uh, there uh, for and ask about an alternative uh, site for the protest their first argument is we are being noticed just because we have blocked the road simply uh second is that actually true are they being noticed just for yes that? of course uh, so many protests happen at jantar mantar what happens to them but there it can't be any argument it can't be the, a solution should be reached because uh, there is a traffic problem uh, additionally uh, the, uh, there are so many outlets on one side of the road of uh, uh, big company outlets are there and uh, they are facing huge loss the entire uh, one season of uh, winters went uh, so uh, uh, all the all the shops are closed so there there should be there should be a, a negotiation between the protesters and the administration political administration police administration and a way should uh, be find out and that's what the supreme court is uh, trying to do did you get that impression uh, no it can't be said what the supreme court i i, I cannot uh, predict what the supreme court is thinking supreme court uh, uh, made it very clear that yes you have right you can protest but uh, you cannot create inconvenience for others who are not taking part in protest so um, has uh, any kind of uh, committee or body been set up which would decide uh, what happens next uh, there are people uh, there are people there are organizers uh, they should be reached out uh, and there should be a solution for that all right thank you so much tari so we all know now who did what and said what at the oscars what we are most excited about is of course parasite the first non english film to win the top award at the oscars my colleague upasna hazarika is a major film buff and she's watched the movie we spoke earlier about what she made of bong joon who's offering Okay, Upasna, welcome. So, uh, let's talk about uh, this uh, film, which has swept the Oscars this time, uh, *Parasite*. Uh, mm -hmm. When you've had a chance to see the film, so uh, when you saw it, could you really tell uh, why it's called *Parasite*? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the the name of the movie is uh, very important because it makes us think: what, who is the parasite, and you know. 
and i think in the movie uh, when we see the movie we see that it's not just you know one particular class of people who are parasites but it's all of us who are parasites you know dependent interdependent in a capitalist world where not just the poor family who goes and starts working and then they uh, infiltrate almost uh, if i can use the word infiltrate uh, the rich family's house but it's also the rich family which is completely dependent on the on the people who are serving them uh, for Uh, their most basic things for their day to day uh, uh, things as well so one very interesting thing is that even the poorer sections depicted in these three families in the film mm-hmm. the the two which are not so rich uh, they were they able to when the crunch time came were they able to put aside their differences and look at each other as poor uh no uh, that is uh, one thing that uh, even bong jun who has uh, also highlighted in some of his interviews is that you know the solidarity amongst the uh, the have nots is some uh, something which is not there in the movie and which he tried to highlight because when it comes uh, to a crucial juncture we see this pe- family is turning against each other without giving the spoilers i would not so yeah so there uh, is of course even amongst them there is this thing of looking down upon somebody who they consider as below their you know and so, and when when you see the film did you feel that you could um, it could relate to every audience because here we have a korean film mm-hmm. and this is a sort of landmark film now for being in the oscars so yeah um I think uh, the way the movie has been made and the treatment that it has got it has got an international feeling it's not like you know even though it's based in Korea it's a very specific situation where they are there but then the the class divide which they are portraying is something uh, people from all across like you know from different parts of the world can relate to uh you were telling me about the metro that was a very fascinating uh... yeah so there is this particular scene in this movie where the rich family they're talking about you know a smell of the subway of the people who travel in the subway so they are uh, uh, kind of you know this they talk about it like you know the smell of the poor people so they are uh, very averse to it and they they don't Uh, they try to remember how it used to uh, smell like traveling in the subway but they are uh, uh, not ready to do n- it not now r- not ready to do it now so so that's uh, right. one thing which i think people can relate to and uh, other things as well yeah all right thank you so much upasna that's all we have in today's episode of let's talk catch us live monday to friday at 3 pm thanks for watching Thank <laughs> you.